Fantastic. Okay, well, good evening, everyone, and good morning, uh, Joe. I'm delighted to uh, invite you all to uh, participate uh, in this uh, webinar, in this talk with uh, Professor Joe Nye. Um, Joe, of course, is a legendary American political scientist, originator of the, the term soft power, and a deep thinker about different types of power and lessons of power over many decades. Uh, Joe has also been closely associated with Ditchley for many years and is a member of the uh, American Ditchley board. And uh, I think it's fantastic to, to have this opportunity to hear from him and his reflections also on, from his new book, uh, Do Morals Matter? Uh, on the implications of the, the crisis and what it means for leadership in, in, in power and power going forward. Um, with Joe tonight, we've got, to, got Dr. Yin Lu, who will be moderating uh, the discussion. Lin is, uh, Yin is thinking uh, deeply about modern power and its different forms. And then we're going to have immediate responses as, uh, from a panel, as it were, from Shahab Khan, uh, a leading journalist uh, in the UK, and uh, Dr. Lise Butler, uh, a historian with a particular interest in the UK. Uh, this is part of Ditchley's uh, virtual program, and what we're trying to do is to give people tools, give people ideas, and give people the connections to try and think through, to review what's happening in this crisis in particular, uh, to reflect on, on the future, uh, to renew their thinking, and to get ready to act, uh, because that's the whole point as to how we respond and how we aim to, to retake the initiative both from this, this storm, um, but also from the economic crisis to come and developments in geopolitics. With that, I'm going to uh, bow out now and hand over to Joe to, to, to start his talk, and then Yin will pick up afterwards. So over to you, Joe. And if we okay. could all panelists, if I could just repeat, if everyone else could make sure we're all on mute, I'll go on mute now. That would be great. Thank you very much, James. It's nice to be back with Ditchley, even though I'd rather be at Ditchley. But uh, those are the limits of the virtual world. I've been asked to <clears throat> say something about painful lessons uh, for strategy and power from the COVID-19 crisis. And I probably the right place to start is with humility, because frankly, at this stage, there's so much we don't know about the pandemic itself. Uh, will there be several waves of it? Uh, how strong is immunity? Uh, when will a vaccine be produced, which is truly effective? Where? And so uh, humility is the order of the day uh, before I start drawing lessons, though that won't stop me from drawing lessons. Uh, but I will also turn to um, uh, a paradox, um, which is how we've all responded so far to the uh, uh, COVID-19 crisis. Uh, there used to be a joke in the Cold War era that the only thing that would bring the United States and the Soviet Union together was the threat of invasion by a creature from Mars. And then we humans would realize that we had something in common and would overcome our various uh, disputes and conflicts. Um, well, uh, we've had the equivalent of an invasion from a creature of Mars. Um, uh, obviously, viruses don't care a hoot about nationality or political divisions. And yet the responses we've seen from humans have been to accentuate existing trends rather than to change behavior. So that maybe should be added to the humility as lesson number one. But it, there are certain things that we can uh, say in terms of thinking about lessons, uh, though with those caveats, they're going to be uh, cautions, uh, cautious lessons. One is, uh, is that uh, to beware of thinking that the COVID crisis is going to change the distribution of, the, of power in world politics, at least in geopolitics, dramatically or rapidly. A number of people have written essays um, saying uh, this is uh, such a huge event. It's so uh, 
earth girdling and shaking that uh, it's going to transform geopolitics. Um, I written the opposite. I think that what we're seeing is an accentuation and acceleration of existing trends rather than a transformation. Now, there may be transformational things that will occur, but on the distribution of power, many people, for example, say this will be the point at which China overtakes the United States and becomes the world's leading power. That, I think, is, is, uh, is less likely. Um, I think that, uh, for one thing, if you look at, at, uh, the, at the prior example we had of a, of a massive pandemic in 1918, uh, the so-called Spanish influenza, but that's a misnomer, but it killed more people than World War I killed, uh, which is quite extraordinary. And yet, most historians who look at the effects of the Spanish flu say that it had surprisingly small effects on geopolitics or politics generally. Uh, there were huge changes in geopolitics in the 20s and 30s, but they really arose out of World War I, which killed fewer people than the Spanish flu. And uh, so as we try to think about the effects that this COVID uh, episode is gonna have, we have to remember that um, Sometimes uh, small causes have big effects, and sometimes big causes do not have big effects. So on the distribution of power geopolitically, I think we have to remember uh, that various aspects of power are often slow to change. There's a certain amount of inertia. So if we think of three types of power based on resources, military power, economic power, and soft power, on military power, uh, the United States is about three times the military budget of China. It is uh, uh, much more global in its reach. And in that sense, the idea that over a few years, uh, China would pass the Americans in military power at the global scale uh, is unlikely. What's more likely in, the mil in relation to military power is that you're going to have a more diverting of attention away from some of the issues in military power that previously dominated. And there may be some changes in the budgetary sense. In other words, the economic uh, side effects of the pandemic may have some budgetary implications. But in short, I don't see a big transformation in the distribution of military power. On economic power, if you can go back to geopolitics and whether China is going to surpass the U.S. as a result of this. Um, I think that uh, that's also probably unlikely. Both countries have been damaged economically. It measured at exchange rates, China's about 66% the size of the U.S. economy. It's hard for me to see that that difference is going to be made up by the effects, of, differential effects of the pandemic. Uh, it's possible that a Chinese economy recovering strongly and quickly uh, can make up some of that gap. Um, but I don't think the differential is going to be that great. I think more likely what you're going to see in relation to economic power is uh, more nearshoring of supply chains. You're going to see uh, efforts to become less dependent on China. Uh, and you're going to see a certain amount of deglobalization. But even that, I think, is going to be limited. As my colleague Ken Rogoff recently pointed out, the costs of cutting supply chains and of true deglobalization, the economic costs, are quite enormous and would be for both China and the U.S. So some degree of decoupling, but uh, not, as some people have said, the end of globalization. Um, on the third aspect of power based on resources, soft power, the uh, ability to get what you want through attraction rather than coercion or payment, um, many people said, well, China is putting enormous efforts into changing the narrative and becoming the hero of, of this episode and that, uh, uh, you know, it, what's sometimes called face mask diplomacy, providing uh, uh, PPE and other things for different countries is going to give China a great leg up. Again, it's going to be hard to close the gap. If you look at the Soft Power 30 Index, which is published in London every year, 
Uh, the U.S. ranks in the top five. China is ranked about number 27. It's hard to see that the provision of a few face masks is going to make uh, a great difference in that gap. This is reinforced by public opinion polls by Pew and Gallup and, and others. So I don't see a massive redistribution of power, geopolitical power, as a result of the pandemic. But as I said at the beginning, I may be wrong. But uh, if I had to make a bet, uh, uh, I would not bet that this will be the change. I think, however, that uh, what we're seeing as a result of the pandemic is a dramatization of what I've written about a number of times and conclude this new book with, which is uh, the new types of threat to national security. Um, you might divide it into traditional threats and, and uh, transnational threats. The traditional threats are the great power rivalries. The, uh, uh, what we're seeing over time is a shift of uh, power in the world economy from west to east, not just to China, to Asia more generally. And uh, along with that, you have the dangers that go with with great power rivalries, something we've seen before uh, and something we know how to manage or mismanage, but it's familiar. The other great shift in power that we're seeing is from states to non-state and transnational actors and forces. And this is newer and harder to cope with. And the, the COVID um, virus, uh, the coronavirus, is a great example of this. Uh, it knows no boundaries. It couldn't care less. It can't be kept out by walls or tariffs or whatever. And uh, of course, climate change is, is another great example, which is one in which uh, basically boundaries don't matter. And to go back to the US-China relationship, uh, both the US and China uh, combined uh, produce about 40% of greenhouse gases, and neither of them can solve this problem acting alone, uh, or even just the two of them alone uh, together. Uh, it has to have a much broader international cooperation. So in that sense, these new forces uh, of a, unlike economic globalization, which are strongly affected by uh, po political and economic laws, these new forces of transnationalism are what you might call ecological globalization, and they obey the laws of biology and physics. And that's why the traditional uh, political devices and responses are not very relevant to them. And that gives rise to this point that, uh, that I have been trying to stress, which is we have to think of two types of power. If power is the ability to get the outcomes you want, to affect others, to get them to do what you want, um, we're all familiar and spend a lot of time on power over others. Uh, as I build my uh, military or my economy or whatever, I can increase my power over others. We have to pay more attention to power with others, that there may be some objectives which we can't get by trying to exercise power over another, but has to be done with. I mean, to be slightly facetious on climate change, I suppose you could say that you could use military power to bomb uh, coal-fired plants in China, uh, but uh, that would not be very effective in, the, in terms of solving the problem. So there's no way out of this except to think of power with China uh, and for China to think of power with the US when it comes to issues like climate change or pandemics. But then that goes to my third uh, point, which is types of strategy which is if you look at the strategies which we have now, uh, they're really not optimized for these new types of threat to national security. If you look at um, the American national security strategy that President Trump announced at the end of 2017, uh, it stressed great power competition. And uh, we were going to focus all our resources on great power competition and increase the defense budget and uh, that was going to be uh, the heart of our military, of our national security strategy. And so we're spending about $700 billion uh, on military uh, capacity. Uh, 
uh, to prevail in this great power competition. Now, as a former Assistant Secretary of Defense, uh, I'm not one to be anti-defense, but I do have to point out that those expenses have little to do with the new types of threats that I mentioned. And you can say, yes, but those are the real threats and these new threats are not so important. Well, if that's true, let's think about the impact that we've seen from COVID in terms of costs. Over 110 million Americans have been killed uh, and the economy has gone into a deep recession where unemployment is somewhere in the range of 13 or 14 percent and not likely to, to change uh, very quickly. Um, if somebody had done that damage to us, killed 100 million people and sent the economy in a 10 percent or 12 percent uh, depression, uh, by bombing us or invading us, um, we would be furious. We would declare war. And yet when we have a virus which has done this to us, uh, we declare, declare a medical, metaphorical war, but we don't develop a strategy in, 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 that's consistent with that perception of the, of the new threat. So the fact that um, uh, the COVID uh, episode, this pandemic, has killed more Americans than died in our wars in Korea, Vietnam, and Iraq, um, should tell us there's something wrong with our strategy, that, uh, that uh, we really have not got things in any sense of proportion to how we should be investing. So that brings me to my next point, which is we we're gonna have to develop a strategy that pays more attention to power over which a uh, power with uh, at the same time that we're thinking about power over. You can't ignore traditional geopolitics or competition. We have to learn to realize that you can have competition and cooperation at the same time. And we can invest in ways in which we can deal with both simultaneously rather than either or. Uh, and we're not doing that yet. Uh, what we've seen in the, uh, in the current American administration is the devaluing of alliances and multilateralism, uh, the power with. And uh, President Trump has uh, talked about America first and uh, a very national and narrow transactional view. Uh, what I point out in my book on Do Morals Matter is it's not that a political leader should sacrifice the national interest, he or she cannot. After all, you're elected to be a trustee for, for others. What matters is not whether you sacrifice the national interest, how you define the national interest. Do you find it so narrowly that it excludes others or so broadly that it can be in your interest and the interest of others as well? So that suggests that there could have been and may still be an alternative strategy for dealing with the current COVID crisis. Uh, I've argued that if we'd had, what we've seen from the top leadership and Trump and Xi Jinping are pretty much the same on this. They both started out with denial, which lost crucial time, which when you're dealing with something exponential like a, a virus uh, expanding uh, is deadly. Uh, the denial was, fo was uh, followed by constraints on information, blame shifting and propaganda wars and no real cooperation. Uh, the Americans made this even worse by threatening the withdrawal from the WHO. Uh, all the wrong types of strategy for what we could have done. And the net effect of this, I think, has been a great damage to America, both in our, our hard and, and soft power. Now, was there an alternative? And what I argue is that, yes, if you go back and you look at some of the presidents who dealt with the world after 1945, uh, and you notice what they did, we could have done something analogous in response to COVID. I don't think this president could have done it, but as a, in, as a thought experiment or an existence theorem, it's an alternative strategy. We could have done something like the Marshall Plan, 
Uh, the Marshall Plan, the Americans were giving away about 2% of their GDP, it was a significant amount of money, to help European recover, uh, Europeans recover economically. Uh, we didn't do it just out of humanitarianism. We did it because it was in our national interest in the competition we had in the Cold War. But it was good for us, it was also good for Europeans. And you could define our national interest then in, in such a way that it was broadly in our interest, both as a humanitarian interest and in self-interest. We could have done something like this with COVID. We could have said that we are going to sponsor with other members of the G20, including China, a massive COVID defense fund open to all poor countries who need help with their infrastructure in developing a capacity to deal with COVID. Uh, now, that would have had a transformative effect, not only on US-China relations, but on uh, how we deal with the future of the, uh, the pandemic. After all, we know from 1918 that uh, the pandemic came in waves, and what's fascinating is that the second wave uh, in the fall of 1918 killed far more people than the first wave. We don't know what's going to happen with a second or third wave of, uh, of COVID-19. And so we may have to face a situation in which we find ourselves thinking we've protected ourselves, we in the northern half of the, of the globe. And in the meantime, you have vast reservoirs uh, built up in the southern half of the globe where people can't cope with it and those reservoirs might overflow northward on a seasonal basis. In the world of modern travel and, tele and communications, that is uh, not an implausible type of scenario. So if you try to say, how could I explain to uh, the public that uh, this strategy which has a degree of altruism in it, not pure altruism, but a degree of altruism in it, is in our interest. The interest is to prevent living in a world where you have a perpetual reservoir of uh, coronavirus uh, uh, ready to come back and attack you when you least expect it. Um, now, I don't know whether that, I don't, I'm sure that the current administration did not consider and probably is incapable of considering that type of uh, strategy since it's so far outside the parameters of how they're thinking about strategy uh, and the world. But it's conceivable that you could have another type of leadership uh, maybe after November, uh, or even if the good Lord were to remove the incumbent president and you had Vice President uh, Trump become president, you might have a rather different approach than the one we've seen. But in any case, Imagine that we are facing something I will call vaccine nationalism. At this stage, we have many, many contenders for vaccines, many companies, many countries, but we don't know who will win or how many will win or how good the various vaccines that are produced will be. Uh, some might be barely adequate, others might be defective, others might be uh, cheaper, others more expensive. There's a lot we don't know about vaccines. There is a possibility at the end of this year, the beginning of next year, that we could set up what you might call a international vaccine fund to help poor countries. Now you can say, why would the president of France or the president of the United States or the prime minister of England, wherever, uh, why would he be willing to not respond to the domestic pressures of my people first? Well, you have to admit that they will have that pressure and figure out how to deal with it. But we're in a situation which the famous liberal philosopher John Rawls uh, called a veil of ignorance. We don't yet know who's going to get what, when, and how. And until we know that, what we could say, suppose we each among the major countries were to put forward into an international COVID vaccination fund uh, a promise that we will make sure that 20% or call it 10% of the vaccines produced will be made available to this fund for free to developing countries. 
And in that sense, uh, we're not relying on pure altruism, but we're saying that there is a degree of altruism and there's also a veil of ignorance. And we don't know whether we're gonna get the first or the best or the cheapest vaccine or China is or whether Britain is or who. But if we all at this stage, when we're behind the Rawlsian veil of ignorance said, we'll promise to dedicate 10%, maybe 20% of these vaccines for this international uh, COVID response fund, uh, we might be able to get an agreement uh, on that and one which we could sell to our own people on that self-interested grounds that it protects us against this reservoir which will have a resurgence which will come back to hurt us in the future. Now I might be asking too much or suggesting too much but it does bring us back to a question which is the importance of leadership and moral leadership. Uh, people have said, oh, authoritarian countries are better than democracies because they can enforce quarantine or whatever. I think if you look at the record, what you'll see is that another of the lessons is that the authoritarians haven't done better than democracies. Uh, uh, if you look at uh, New Zealand and uh, South Korea and Germany, uh, all good democracies, they've done better than, uh, than China, for example. Uh, as well as better than the U.S. And so we can't say that democracy versus authoritarianism is the secret, but you can say that the type of leadership you have, whether the leader is transformational and sees a larger picture and defines the national interest as including the interests of others rather than simply narrowly and transactionally, that could make a difference. And you could, I believe, explain this to the publics in a democracy. So I would conclude by saying that uh, if I return to the paradox with which I started, that the uh, creature from Mars has uh, come to visit us and it couldn't care less about the national boundaries which divides us, all it wants is humans to kill, uh, we have responded in the worst possible way so far. But it's not outside our imagination or the capacity of moral leadership to be able to imagine an alternative scenario. And I'm hoping that even though we fumbled on the first round of the coronavirus, that as we pay, pay, pay attention to the second and third rounds, and particularly with this vaccine nationalism, that we might imagine inventing a better type of proposal. So that's a, those are my tentative painful lessons for strategy and power from the COVID-19 crisis, but I'm staying ready to be corrected. So thanks. Excellent. Thank you so much, Joe, for sharing your wide ranging insights with us. I think there really could be no better way to kickstart Ditchley's uh, virtual speaker sessions. And I think um, you were ultimately more optimistic than I had personally expected, given the title of this talk. Um, I think the key thing is to face the future, as you've said. There is possibly a second wave that could have more impact than the first wave. And if we don't act now, as you said, with a longer term thinking um, that is driven by transformational leadership as opposed to transactional leadership, then we might all be facing a more severe crisis than we are facing now. So it's the time for optimism and for transformational leadership, as you've said. So before going into um, the Q&A, just a couple of housekeeping rules. Um, first of all, there's been a nice uh, chat happening in the webinar chat, uh, but we would ask for you to please put your questions in the Q&A widget from which I will be selecting questions and grouping them accordingly for the rest of this discussion. Uh, before passing it on to um, your questions and uh, also one for myself, I would like to introduce two brilliant respondents, as James mentioned at the beginning of the talk, um, Shahab and Lees, uh, to offer their quick um, uh, resp responses uh, to what Joe has just put forward on the table, as it were. So uh, first we have Shahab Khan. Shahab is an award-winning journalist, currently a political reporter at ITV News. He is part of the UK press lobby and was hired as the youngest political broadcaster for a national news outlet in the UK. He has been a regular participant in the UK's daily coronavirus press briefings at Downing Street, and you can often see him on TV interviewing uh, senior members of the government. So over to you, Shahab. <laughs> 
sorry I think I was muted there um I my first major takeaway was if we end up having an alien invasion I'm not particularly confident that as a planet we would do a very good job at dealing with it especially given uh, how we've dealt with this crisis but as Professor Nye uh, noted coronavirus is one of the first major issues in recent memory that we as a planet have had to deal with where uh, working together and dealing with this crisis through international cooperation is incredibly key and climate change is another one and that's the next major crisis which is coming and are we prepared to deal with it do we have the systems in place well this pandemic makes it very clear that we do not and there was a lot of talk from Professor and I about what the United States are doing um, and I am obviously a journalist in the United Kingdom and there are some striking similarities in what is going on here in the United Kingdom um, in particular preceding this crisis happening there was an isolationist approach taking place from the United Kingdom as we left the European Union a, a multinational organization in which we had been a member for a number of years and it shows that we're, we're ready to take a step back and take a different approach to politics, take a different approach to international relations. Now, I'm not preaching whether one side is better than the other. What I'm merely saying is a decision was taken at that moment that we were going to take a different approach. Now, the impact that we are seeing from this virus is unprecedented. Would a joined up approach have been better if we had a better relationship with other nations around us here in the United Kingdom, if we had a better relationship with the EU? Would our approach have been different? Would it have made a difference? Um, from my understanding of what Professor Nye is saying, perhaps it would have done. And perhaps we are entering a period in which the world's major leaders, in particular Donald Trump, in particular Boris Johnson, are taking a very different approach to what we had seen in the preceding decades. Now, something that really struck me was the talk about vaccines. Um, this idea that we could potentially set up a fund in which um, donations are made for developing nations. Now here in the UK, the government has signed a deal with one of the major pharmaceutical companies, AstraZeneca, uh, to work on a new vaccine in which the priority remains ensuring that vaccines are readily available if there is a breakthrough for British citizens. Now that is obviously going to be the priority. But there was very minimal talk and discussion about how that would be distributed to the rest of the world. And there were similar things in the United States. There have been similar things in the rest of Europe. The focus has remained about how an individual can help its own country. That's not a surprise. It's merely an observation. But perhaps that is something that needs to change if we're going to get to a point where we deal with this crisis and the next spike and the next spike, if that's what happens in tackling this crisis and making sure that people are safe. Because ultimately, there are millions of people's lives at stake. And this crisis and this virus does not go away unless we as a planet come up with a solution where we can work together. Excellent. Thank you, Shahab, for that uh, equally impassioned uh, response. I shall now pass it over to Dr. Lise Butler for the uh, historical uh, perspective on, on things. Lise is a lecturer in modern history at City University of London. She's a historian of modern Britain and she specializes in political history, left-wing politics, and the history of the social sciences. Her first book, Michael Young, Social Science and the British Left, 1945 to 70, is going to be published by OUP this September. Over to you, Lise. Um, thank you, Yen. That was a very nice introduction. Um, so I will start with a caveat that I'm very much not an expert on foreign policy. Um, I'm a historian of British politics and, um, and policy and of the ideas which shape it. Um, but um, I think that as you, know, as you call for us to kind of look forward and, and face the future, I think that in looking at these ideas about um, uh, power with as opposed to power over, um, it's useful to have a, uh, a perspective on the past. And I think that Professor Nye's appeal to power with um, really uh, in some ways embraces a, a, a very positive sense of post-war American um, and in fact, Anglo-American uh, internationalist networks and things like, um, I mean, he specifically talks about the Marshall Plan as being a, a positive example of power with. Um, and I think that we need to be very, very critical about the ways that um, Anglo-American internationalist cooperation institutions, which present, to, which, which present themselves as broadening constituencies and softening divisions, can uh, in many ways allied um, and not fully account um, for 
uh, existing divisions and um, uh, inequalities. Um, so things like the Marshall Plan, the special relationships, uh, and the mechanisms of Cold War soft power are not, of course, born. We're not, of course, born of altruism, um, but of uh, the geostrategic motivations that accompanied the end of empire. Um, and these networks, uh, the networks of liberal internationalist American philanthropy, in many ways, um, served to sustain elite networks that supported American economic and social e economic policies. Right. So I think that in casting a somewhat rose-tinted uh, perspective or, or, or lens to these kinds of post-war American collaborations, um, we need to be mindful of the ways in which they have served to um, reinforce uh, ex uh, global inequalities, which, which are um, perhaps more prevalent and more severe than ever. Um, so um, I think that when we talk about building cooperative and collaborative leadership, we need to be very clear about what foundations we want this collaboration to be premised on. Um, and I uh, really appreciate um, uh, Professor Nye's uh, observation that things like COVID and climate change um, are fundamentally uh, uh, projects which require different forms of transnational leadership, that they are boundaryless problems, uh, which require a different approach altogether. Um, and um, I, I think that uh, in, in addressing them, we need to be very cautious about trying to uh, uh, reinforce or return to some of these um, older models of uh, di diplomacy, um, of intervention, um, which uh, are perhaps rooted in, in a context which, frankly, is not particularly relevant to the modern world. Um, so I'll leave it there. Um, but I hope that we can take, continue to take a historical perspective on um, what these institutions uh, have looked like. Excellent. Thank you so much, Lise, for um, initiating that historical lens um, in this conversation. So uh, I, there's quite a few fantastic questions that have come in uh, to the Q&A. Thank you so much to everyone who has submitted a question. Before I go into uh, this, this list of questions, I'd like to take uh, my prerogative to perhaps ask one myself. And I think one of the kind of dimensions that has been uh, very relevant for COVID-19 and leadership crises that hasn't been explicitly addressed just yet is that of technology. It has transformed the way this crisis has unfurled. It has made things more visible. I mean, it, it's, it's incredible how the way we consume and create information has been fundamentally transformed once again by the internet and mobile phone technology. And this content is usually aggregated in personalized feeds on news websites, social media channels. We are being attacked. And so I think taking into account the information age we live in is absolutely critical when we look at soft power and transformational leadership during crisis. And so with that in mind, my question at a very, very high level is, is around the importance of telling the best story to win hearts and minds. It is about framing things so that you could frame it as self-interest, as you said, uh, Joseph, uh, in your talk, but also as, as something that benefits you if you work together. So it's about framing, it's about how you, how you frame the narrative. And so the high level question I have for you is, how do we best reach the vast audience we have today through public diplomacy, through technology that we have with the internet and mobile phones? How do we take advantage of it without falling prey to the, the weaknesses that have been exposed over the past decade? I think the key dimension in mind is, is around credibility and authenticity which is key to soft power, that is, in a sense, easier to communicate than it ever has been. If you look back at the 1960s, the first innovation was television. That transformed uh, presidential debates and elections. We could argue that Kennedy perhaps won, partly because of this new medium. And now we've got the next wave, which is social media. Tick-tock diplomacy. That is what is happening right now, Gen Z, is the TikTok generation, Snapchat, even Instagram. 
And so on a low level, my question is around the new forms and styles that we need to harness in communication on these platforms. TikTok is known for, for brevity, short videos, 15 seconds, humor, uh, dancing. And, and it is becoming a very, very, very important force in politics today. So high level is how do we harness internet technology to tell the best story and to uh, enact public diplomacy now? and low level thoughts on TikTok and other platforms. And the funny thing with TikTok is of course, it is a Chinese company to add a further element there. Uh, uh, can I respond now? Yes. Okay, uh, I, these are all great comments and questions. Um, I'll, I'll differ slightly for, uh, with, with what Lisa said about increasing inequality. I mean, the liberal international order, as I've pointed out, was never liberal or fully international or fully in order. Um, but uh, it was basically mostly Western world. China and India, for example, were outside it. So it was uh, uh, not the whole world. But the inequality that um, it, it, it produced was less um, the north-south inequality than domestic. In other words, what happened is that uh, more people got richer. There was a reduction of poverty in the world than any time in history. But inside rich countries, uh, poor people got poorer. And the reason is as your job or your factory goes from Ohio or Birmingham to, um, a, to Bangladesh or China, uh, somebody in China or Bangladesh gets better off uh, somebody in Ohio or Birmingham gets worse off. And it was that inequality which gave rise to the populism that we're seeing now. So I agree with you there, there's an increase in inequality and insufficient attention to how the elites coped with inequality, but it wasn't the North-South uh, inequality globally. Uh, it was the domestic inequality that gave rise to uh, populism and nationalism, which I think is the greater danger. But let me go to the to the other point um, uh, that, uh, that uh, about narrative and of the effects of technology. I think this is very important. It's something I've spent a fair amount of time uh, thinking and writing about. And that difference of technology and the internet and social media may be why you're going to see a different outcome from this pandemic than you saw in 1918. 1918, as I said, was much more lethal than the pandemic we're going through now, but there was no social media. And that meant the effects were more restricted to local communities. Um, and so it, I think it, that's why, to start with my point of humility, we gotta be careful not to, read 1918 into 2021. But um, I think your point is correct that credibility of the narrative is gonna be crucial. And the question of how can leaders uh, create that credible narrative? Um, I'm always struck by the fact that um, after World War II, when France uh, was faced with the prospect of what do you do with Germany, which had invaded the country three times in 70 years, uh, the natural reaction would have been take away the Tsar land again, uh, or the Ruhr, uh, keep Germany down, keep the split and so forth. Instead, what you have was the extraordinary idea of Jean Monnet and others, which is if we do that, we're just repeating the same problems. Whereas if we can put European coal and steel together into one community, uh, we can make it a common interest. So Franco-German rivalry persisted. There was still deep animosity and fears after the World War II, but Monet was able to persuade Schumann and with him uh, uh, de, de, de Gasparri and, and uh, others to join in this new project, which eventually became the European Union, which for all its flaws and faults is a very different type of Europe than if, if the French had tried the same type of response to Germany in 1945 that they had tried in 1918. 
So, and that was pre-internet. That would, but that was that was transformational leadership. Somebody with a vision who said, "I can define French interests broadly enough that it can also leave a role for Germany, which doesn't have to be national opposition." And uh, so, I think it is plausible to imagine something that, uh, to go back to my vaccine example, uh, where you could sell this to the public. Yeah, I think it's no harder a sell than to tell Frenchmen in 1945 that they should uh, be nice to the Germans, which is probably harder, harder yet. So, and that takes me finally then to Shahab's important points. On the, uh, on the vaccines, um, you can't imagine a company or a country saying, I'm going to give it, uh, I'm not going to give it first to my own. That's just the nature of the world we live in but you could imagine them reserving a certain proportion. So maybe, we, maybe the altruism gene in human nature is only worth 10% and the selfish genes are worth 90%. But if you could get enough countries to put those 10% together, it would matter. Now there already is a, the Gavi, the uh, International Alliance on Vaccines and new organizations like CEPI and so forth. Uh, so we, it, as an existence theorem, it can be done, but I'm talking about something at a much larger scale. And there, uh, to pick up a point that Shahab made about the role of companies, you can imagine companies saying, even if the governments aren't doing this, we could make an agreement that we will pool a certain amount of our uh, resources uh, to agree on joint production and distribution. So it, it, it wouldn't be just governmental, it could also uh, involve some of the major uh, uh, companies. And frankly, Big Pharma would benefit from that. The reputation and the political standing of Big Pharma has been uh, dreadful, at least in the United States in recent years with the opioid crisis and so forth. And were they to pick up a plan like this, uh, it would actually be a good investment for their own uh, soft power. Uh, and so I think that it, 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 I've, I, what I'm trying to argue is that, there, that it's not totally out of the question that with the right type of leadership and using both governmental and non-governmental instruments, we could uh, see a different approach than what we've seen so far. I must say, Joe, I am extremely impressed by how you've managed to address so many disparate points in, in your response just now. How do you do it? It's incredible. Uh, oh, you um, just get old. <laughs> you get old, you see it off. The way you frame it, it's genius. <laughs> I, I'm completely sold. Anyhow, I, um, I think it's now fair to uh, open it up to the audience um, officially. Uh, as we've received a large volume of excellent, excellent questions. And I think also it is fair to perhaps give uh, Robert Fox the first one, as he was the only one to pre-submit a question via email. So Robert would like to know, um, he, he, he would like to know something about the, the uh, phenomenon of uh, the free and, 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 vis and viable press in the current climate. So. This free and viable press is under attack uh, from all dimensions and subverted by critics and authority um, in the US and UK administrations. So Robert's question is fundamentally, do we need a reconsideration of the First Amendment and the English Bill of Rights fit for our times? Well, uh, I agree with the importance of a free and viable press. Uh, I don't think that changing the First Amendment is the right uh, way to approach it. I think uh, what we're going to need is a better understanding of the importance of the press, which affects, which depends to some extent on leadership, but also what is the press? Um, just last week, President Trump picked up a, uh, a fallacious report from a very small right-wing uh, television station that uh, produces or it can, uh, does a lot with conspiracy theories and retweeted it about this uh, elderly person in Buffalo who was pushed down by the police and sent to the, to the hospital. 
Um, and the, uh, you know, should there have been something preventing that right wing American television station from uh, uh, publishing that conspiracy theory? And what about uh, what about the faith in Twitter? Uh, Twitter is now putting a warning on some Trump tweets that this should be fact-checked or don't take it at face value. Uh, Facebook is saying, no, we're not going to interfere with political speech. So I think, yes, we need to spend a lot more in our domestic political debates about the importance of free and fair press. But we're going to have to face the question of what are the boundaries of the press and how much do we want uh, social media through which a lot of people consume their news today to act like newspapers or like uh, uh, telecommunications companies and so forth. I think that's, I'd, rather than trying to amend the First Amendment, I'd rather have more refinement of the debate in those areas. And that becomes a legislative matter in the US because there's a proposal to amend the Communications Decency Act, which was passed in the 1990s, to change section 230 which is the section which treats uh, the social media companies as though they were communications companies and not press. Uh, and that's being hotly debated in the Congress now. So I think that's where the debate is gonna come that's gonna be most meaningful, not uh, whether we better protect the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times. Thank you for that, General. I could not agree more. Uh, through my own research at the Oxford Internet Institute, um, I've been looking into, you know, how traditionally Facebook and Twitter have been very hands-off when it comes to information flow, but they cannot um, avoid that responsibility in this climate, especially what's given what's been happening. And um, going back to TikTok, actually, uh, it has that platform has been called cable news for young people. So we have to look, in a sense, even beyond just Facebook and Twitter and YouTube now. So um, going to the questions from the audience submitted by the uh, live Q&A widget, of which there are now 25, um, I fear we might not be able to get to all of them. So I'll do my very best to uh, group them spontaneously if I can. Um, there, are, I guess, let's start with a higher level one, um, which is, one second, sorry. There's a bit, a bit of difficulty navigating uh, the very large um, number of questions on the, on the widget. Um, I would like to ask uh, the question posed by Jennifer Anderson, which is about transformational leadership applying in a situation where you have intersecting crises. So not just the social dimension alone or the biological dimension alone, but when they intersect, so virus plus climate emergency, virus plus social unrest. I think the um, Black Lives Matter movement is the elephant in the room. And it's fascinating that that's happened in the midst of the crisis and that so many people have chosen to defy lockdown rules and stand up for what they believe is right and uh, solidarity basically um, being viewed as, as more important than obeying uh, the laws of lockdown. Well, I, I, it, I think you could argue that America is now experiencing uh, three simultaneous crises. Uh, the pandemic, um, the economic uh, deep recession, which has accompanied it, and uh, now the racial discrimination protests, which are summarized as Black Lives Matter, but it's more than just that. It's also police brutality more generally and racism more generally. A, the, uh, the leadership we have has tried to um, dodge and weave in about all of these. I mean, uh, denial and, uh, uh, and blame shifting on the pandemic, um, undue optimism about the economic recovery, and uh, uh, basically trying to change the topic to law and order rather than dealing with these underlying problems of racism on the third crisis. Uh, a transformational leader, let's say a, a Nelson Mandela or a 
or a uh, Gandhi or a or a, a Martin Luther King would say, I'm going to put these together. I'm going to say we have a deep problem. We've been attacked by uh, by a creature from Mars, and it has exacerbated or revealed some of our deeper problems. It has killed people unequally, but people have been killed unequally in our society uh, from other means as well. And I'm going to propose a plan or approach to this in which we'll have a transformation of how we deal with race and how we deal with economic inequality. And it's not going to be simple. It doesn't happen overnight, but it's going to be something where we'll work together on all three. Um, if you look at New Zealand, one of the things that strikes me about Jacinda Ardern's approach has been, she's talked about uh, uh, our family of five million. Uh, we're all in this together. In other words, she's, she's been a powerful unifying force. And uh, uh, that's very different from the strategy that uh, President Trump has taken, which a lot of leaders take, which is divide and rule. In other words, I, if I can divide people against each other, uh, I can at least keep enough behind me and will identify the other as outside the pale, so forth. But that's a disastrous way to respond to simultaneous crises. So in that sense, um, I think a transformational leader would lump the crises into one larger crisis, say this is a common challenge we face, which has been revealed by this uh, uh, you know, external force, and we're gonna develop a plan to work on all of them together. Uh, I don't see it happening until, uh, I, at least under this administration, Goodness, thank you so much, Joe, for that. You have answered uh, another question from Belinda Luscombe. So thank you for that. <laughs> um, excellent. I think, yes, the, the, that particular case study of New Zealand is, is a great one um, to bring up, very timely. Um, I think you've also addressed another question from, from Gerald Green, which is about the vanishing distinction between domestic and international issues. Uh, he would like you to address that vanishing distinction. Um, so not sure if you would like to comment on that in the next. In well, the next I mean, it, it is a, a, a blurring. Sometimes there was a colleague of mine who once called this intermestic. It's neither international nor domestic. And there are an increasing number of issues, which essentially uh, I call them transnational because they cross borders outside the control of government. And I think I first uh, edited a book on transnational relations and how it was changing world politics back in the 1970s. So I've been worried about this for a long time, but um, and now it's becoming obviously much more dramatic. And in the, in the last chapter of this uh, book, Do Morals Matter, that I just uh, published, uh, I argued that uh, the two great challenges for moral leadership, uh, at least for American presidencies, are going to be to manage the relationship with China so that it doesn't get out of hand and break into war, but also to cooperate enough with China and others so that we can deal with these types of issues that require power with rather than power over. And to teach the American people that you can do these things simultaneously. That's gonna be the hard part, which is to, to avoid the temptation to to play just to one side or the other of that. Uh, I don't see it yet, but uh, it's not out of the question. Great, I think we'll get to China very soon. There's been a number of questions around China. Um, also, thank you very much to um, Ditchley staff, uh, to Katie and Martin for enabling this fantastic upvote feature. I highly recommend everyone in the audience to please uh, help me review these questions. And if you like one, uh, just click the, the um, up thumbs up icon in the lower left of each question. Thank you. So amongst these upvoted questions, we've got a really interesting one around middle powers. There's been a lot of talk about China and the US and we'll get to that beast in a second. Um, but the question is around middle powers working together. Uh, hang on, sorry, the upvoting is causing my Q&A to skip. Uh, middle powers <laughs> working together to protect their interests and defending the global rules on which all of us depend. 
Um, or do you think the middle powers don't really have the, the weight, the soft power or hard power, uh, or degree of common interest um, that is required? Uh, so the UK, Canada and Australia being three examples of middle powers, they can agree a lot, um, but is it enough to make a real difference? And, and if so, which areas can it make a difference? That's from Malcolm Chalmers. Well, it's a great question. My, my friend, uh, Kevin Rudd, the former Australian Prime Minister, uh, once proposed a month or so ago a, what he called an M10, or Middle Powers uh, Group, which would propose multilateral approaches. Um, and I think that makes a lot of sense. You know, I think stepping into the vacuum uh, makes sense. But frankly, uh, unless the largest economies, the US and China together, about 40% of uh, or more of the world economy, unless they're playing in the game, uh, it's hard for the middle powers to determine things. Uh, so finding ways in which they can leverage the larger powers uh, is an important uh, way for the middle powers to play the game. But with that said, the middle powers can still uh, play a role. For example, when, uh, when Trump foolishly withdrew the United States from the Paris Climate Accords, the fact that other powers stayed in uh, meant that there is a framework there which uh, we can return to if we have a change in, in, uh, in American election. Um, similarly, uh, I think if you look at, at Europe, uh, the initial reaction of European countries, of EU countries, was not very impressive. They all scattered and went their own ways. But um, after uh, May, you began to see the European powers pulling together and then Macron and Merkel agreed on uh, a major fund to resolve the North-South division inside Europe. Uh, which would come partly at the expense of German, Dutch, and other taxpayers who resisted that. Um, that was an interesting illustration that Europe could pull itself together. And the Europeans also have taken the lead on developing a pledging conference for vaccines. Um, frankly, until the Americans and the Chinese join it, it won't do what I'm looking for in this vaccine proposal, but at least the Europeans have started moving in a direction which is pointing the way. Uh, so I, I would argue that the, the middle powers should have no illusions that they can uh, dispense with the largest powers, uh, but they certainly taking initiatives uh, can make a difference. So I, I think I'd like to see a lot more of it. Excellent. Very uh, optimistic response. Thank you. Um, the most popular question, as judged by our fantastic audience here, is from Bobby Vidrol. It's about the economic dimension of all this. It's actually a sneaky question. It's two questions in one. I'll let you decide, Joe, whether you want to answer one or both or neither. Uh, so, in Bobby's words, doesn't the massive economic cost of COVID-19 make political brinkmanship more likely. So for example, cost of hard Brexit, worst estimate 8% over 10 years, is now a, a rounding error considering the cost of COVID-19. So no deal apparently is more likely. Second question, isn't it now more likely for China, the elephant in the room, to act forcefully in the South China Sea slash Taiwan as the economic cost is now much lower thanks to the virus? Well, um very interesting questions and all we can do is, is speculate because uh, these are hypotheticals that uh, are subject to a lot of things that haven't yet occurred. But with that said, uh, there are a lot of people in Washington who are, are warning about China taking advantage of America's diversion by its three crises, uh, pandemic, uh, uh, race and uh, economic to uh, make advances on other countries. I think this has been somewhat exaggerated. Um, the, uh, if you look at the question of on the South China Sea in particular, would uh, uh, the United States give up freedom of navigation operations, which are designed to enforce the judgment of the Hague Tribunal on the law of the sea, that China's artificial islands do not uh, 
earn a territorial sea under the law of the sea convention. I don't think that's going to change. I mean, I, I, I don't think the Americans are going to be paying less attention to that or are going to give up freedom of navigation operations uh, because of the three crises at home. Uh, and as for China, China has a lot on its plate. Uh, many people uh, tell me that uh, the various advances in the Belt and Road Initiative, which had been top of Xi Jinping's agenda, uh, they're beginning to pull back on some of them. For one thing, if you want to tie it to economics, many of the countries which China has loaned money to for Belt and Road projects, uh, the money was loaned, not granted like the Marshall Plan. It was loaned at high interest rates, and many of these countries can't pay. And they're not only uh, pulling back from wanting these or accepting some of these projects, but the Chinese are uh, themselves beginning to worry about whether they're going to get repaid. Uh, when I was in Beijing last fall talking to some uh, uh, Chinese officials, I, I, there was a subcurrent of concern that China was already overextended on its Belt and Road Initiative things. What the COVID uh, economic crisis has done is, I think, uh, not accelerated Belt and Road, but decelerated it. Uh, so I don't. I I think that the alarmism that uh, uh, we're all going to be distracted, China's going to steal the world while we're looking at other things. I think this is exaggerated. But there are such fears, and you can certainly read about them in Washington every day. Um, as for the the first point about political brinksmanship and the fact that the economic costs may uh, swamp other uh, dimensions leading to a, uh, uh, a hard Brexit, I don't know how to judge that. I'm not close enough to the somebody who's there in the UK or to, or to give the answer to it. I, I, I'm not convinced that things were on a good track even before COVID, uh, that there was going to be the negotiated uh, 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 agreement with the, with the, between the EU, but I don't, I, I, I don't know that uh, that could go either direction. Well, there are quite a few members uh, of the UK in this virtual room, and I'm sure that they would be very um, happy to comment. Perhaps in the webinar chat, I would encourage everyone to do so. Uh, regarding the China question, I think your answer, Joe, touches upon just how interconnected everything is. And it really is not a black and white situation that a country like China could walk away uh, and benefit. Although I think it's interesting how in Western media, that narrative of China taking advantage is so salient. There's something very compelling about that narrative. Interesting. Um, but going back towards the Q&A, uh, Edward Mortimer has asked the most popular question of the moment. He is surprised, Joe at your conclusion that the net effect of the pandemic is to diminish state power. According to Edward, most analysts note that society, including the private sector, has become much more dependent on state support and that populations by and large are more ready to accept state interference with their lives, for example, in lockdowns. Do you think these increases in state power will only be temporary? And if so, why? Well, it's a great question, Edward. It, it, um, um, certainly in the short run, we're seeing an emphasis on uh, the role of the state and the role of government um, along the lines you mentioned. Um, the question, uh, the economist had a cover on this, uh, I don't know, early in the crisis, which is with this increased state power, is it here to stay or will it uh, uh, reverse? Uh, I tend to think these things are more cyclical rather than long-term secular trends. In other words, I think there are enough other things going on with technology and so forth that uh, are, lead to this diffusion of power that I don't think that you're going to see this. Now, that's for the democracies that I'm speaking. Uh, for the non-democracies, for the authoritarians, I think it may be different. In other words, if you look at Orban in Hungary or you look at Bolsonaro uh, trying to become more autocratic in Brazil or, or you look at Xi Jinping and, and uh, is tightening down on party control of all uh, aspects of society, 
uh, the COVID uh, pandemic uh, is a great excuse. And you can, you can get, I think you can get a list of much longer than the three that I enumerated of countries where an authoritarian leader has used the pandemic as the excuse to tighten power. Uh, the desire to tighten power and the propensity was there uh, before, but this provided the excuse. And, uh, uh, and I think it, uh, we may then find somewhat different effects that the, in terms of uh, democracies, uh, you may have something which I regard as cyclical, that there will be other forces and trends which will, uh, which will mean that the increase in state power versus society uh, changes back towards something more that we're accustomed to. But it may be that in some authoritarian states, uh, it will be a uh, slippery slide. But it's a great question, and I don't think anybody knows the answer, and that includes me. Thank you for your humility there, Joe. Excellent, going back to the very first topic uh, of our discussion. Um, so just looking at the time, I think we have time for a couple more questions. I'm so sorry that there's, there's 24 at the moment. Um, thanks to upvoting, we can filter through a bit. Uh, but just to say, to set expectations, we'll have time for about a couple more questions. Then we'll have some closing remarks from Shahab, Lees, uh, and James. So going to the next uh, question at the top of the list from Timothy Garton Ash. Um, he's got a couple of questions that follow on from other questions. Always good to connect with previous questions, Timothy. First one is, what chance does the Biden administration have of adopting your, uh, Joseph, uh, your proposed approach uh, on COVID, i.e. this uh, International Vaccine Fund, which is the 21st century version of the Marshall Plan? Um, and, and two, um, how would Biden-China policy differ from Trump's? Um, great questions from my friend, Tim. <laughs> uh, I, on the first question, I hesitate to speak for uh, the Biden uh, uh, group. I, I, uh, I uh, know a lot of them quite well, and I have indeed talked to some of them, but I don't want to pretend that what I say would commit any of them. But one of the things I've talked to uh, about is, is it plausible to think of, in a time of deep recession, of proposing something like this? Um, and I, I think there's some who think that if it's put the right way, it's not totally implausible, but it's certainly not an idea that has been adopted by the Biden campaign. So uh, I will keep trying to push it as a private citizen, somebody who writes op-eds uh, and so forth. But uh, I, I, you're predicting what uh, the Biden administration will do uh, uh, if it's, it's elected is a lot harder. On the, on the China policy, it's a little bit easier to predict because Trump is going to make China a central political football in the uh, election. Uh, he needs, he's, he's great at blame shifting and he needs to shift blame and China is, uh, gives him a, a good target for this. And so I think the Biden campaign, and this is not from talking to people, this is just from reading the newspapers or surmising, the Biden campaign has to be very careful not to fall into a trap by talking uh, all about peace and goodwill and returning to the past on China. Uh, so I think in the campaign, you're going to see pretty similar rhetoric from the two sides, though Trumpian rhetoric is always uh, more excessive, but, it, uh, but I don't think you're going to see uh, Biden defending Trump, uh, China while Trump is attacking it. On the other hand, uh, the interesting question is what happens if there is a Biden administration? And there, I, you're not going to return to the past because uh, the mood about China has changed in the US. There's really, well, if Hillary Clinton had won in 2016, resentment of China manipulation of the process with uh, state-owned banks uh, giving subsidies to state-owned enterprises and or using coercive measures for intellectual property transfer, this had already created a a sour mood in the Congress and even in some of the business community. Uh, so if there is a Biden administration, 
um, I don't, I mean, that agenda, the pre-existing agenda will still be there. Uh, on the other hand, the style and the management of the relationship with China will be quite different. I mean, Trump, uh, you know, basically did it unilaterally, going it alone, putting tariffs on allies as well as on China and so forth. I think you'll have a, you'll still have a tough on China approach, but with a, with a quite different tone. And you'll have some areas like climate and World Health Organization and so forth, where I think you're going to see, would see in a Biden administration, much greater willingness to work together uh, uh, cooperatively. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for that, Joe. Um, I'm aware now that, that Shahab has to leave very shortly for a press conference. So I shall give him about 30 seconds uh, to make some final remarks. Yeah, I'm actually going to be shooting off to do the news bulletin that starts uh, at 6.30 here in the UK. So I'm, I've got a few minutes. Thank you very much, Professor and I. Um, I hope everyone continues the discussion. It's been particularly interesting. I, I'm just fascinated by the idea of what will happen, not only in terms of a second spike or how we deal with issues that are similar to this, like climate change, which you've mentioned several times, which do not respect boundaries. Um, and I'm sure the discussion will continue on that, especially um, as... Dr. Lou mentioned the role of technology. We do live in a different world to the one at the time of the Spanish flu, where you mentioned there wasn't a particular change in um, power relations and there wasn't a change in the world superpower or the hegemon. And that could be different this time around simply because there is a new element involved here, technology, and it could have a huge and fascinating impact on how we deal with not only this crisis, but the next one and climate change and the one after that. So I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on that. Uh, but I hope everyone's enjoyed the talk and I hope the discussions continue uh, while I go sit in a studio and talk about coronavirus. Good luck with the news. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Shahab. Good afternoon, goodbye. Um, I think in terms of next steps, I will give uh, Professor Nye a choice actually. What I will do is summarize the top three upvoted questions and give him about three minutes to answer as little or as many of those questions as he would like. Does that sound good to you, Joe? Fine with me. Okay. Number one, um, from Annette Hester. She has said, following John Holmes's thinking and adding the international efforts on vaccines from the Gates Foundation, how do you believe non-state actors, non-state actors could be effective holders of soft power? Number two, from Dominic Grieve, what is your view on how the US sees global recovery and in particular in Europe? The UK performance on COVID is very mixed. So how will this UK performance influence the way that America sees Britain in its wider context of being a reliable international partner? Number three, from Joao Valle de, de Albaida. Apologies for butchering your name, Joao. Um, he would like to pick your brain, Professor Nye, on uh, the following. What would you advise the EU to do in reaction to a serious decoupling between the US and China? Three fantastic questions. I'll give you about three minutes to address any of these. Well, um, I'll be happy to be quick. Um, on the first one, yes, non-state actors definitely can have soft power and uh, they often work a fair amount on it. I mean, when companies do things to maintain their brands, that's to maintain or invest in their soft power. So, uh, and when the Gates Foundation uh, supports Gavi or gives its own grant to the World Health Organization, uh, that helps the soft power of the Gates Foundation. It also, there's a, it has some beneficial effects for the U.S. to the extent that Gates as a foundation is uh, identified with the U.S. that helps U.S. soft power. I've written a, written a piece uh, uh, just recently for the Hill, a Washington uh, uh, blog, um, can the U.S. recover its soft power? And my argument is yes, because so much of American soft power doesn't depend on the government, depends so much on civil society, which includes everything from Hollywood to Harvard um, and the Gates Foundation as well. Uh, so that's one. On question two, uh, how the U.S. will see um, Great Britain, uh, it, it a lot will depend on whether Trump is reelected. Um, 
uh, Trump has an admiration for the uh, for the Prime Minister of Britain, and, and uh, uh, that will have some effect. Uh, I think a lot of the American um, foreign policy establishment thought that Britain made a, a mistake on Brexit, that Britain actually had more influence on both sides of the Atlantic when it was a pivotal point in between, uh, and that it's, it's given up that pivot point that uh, was so, so effective as a national strategy for Britain. But frankly, I think the British-American relationship is going to be reasonably strong. You may say that I'm the victim of Oxford or, or Britain's soft power because I tend to be somewhat Anglophile as a result of all that, but, um, or ditchly soft power. Um, but I, I don't think you're going to see a dramatic worsening of, of US-UK uh, uh, relations. On the third question of advising uh, the EU on how to handle a decoupling in US-China relations, uh, again, this will depend in part on the nature of the next U.S. government. I think there will be a degree of decoupling, and I think it's very important to get some rules of the road as to how decoupling will be handled. Uh, there's some aspects, for example, uh, I would not allow Huawei to build uh, uh, 5G because there are real security issues. And when Chinese complain about this, I say, well, how come then that Google can't work in China. It's for security reasons or Facebook. So you'll have to say, let's get some rules of the road in which there'll be areas where we agree to decouple without letting it get into a tit for tat that spreads into, into all domains. We still benefit from having uh, supply chains which uh, are transnational. And so I think you could imagine a reform of the World Trade Organization uh, or some supplemental agreement saying here are the rules of the road for what is legitimate and not legitimate decoupling uh, without and so that the decoupling question is not either or we either go to zero or a hundred percent we're going to find some dial in something in between and frankly the Europeans can play a useful role uh, in that I mean, the Europeans suffer as well as the U.S. when China uses uh, coercive measures to, for intellectual property transfer or subsidies to state-owned enterprises. So it's not as though the, when people say, oh, the Europeans will have to choose between China and the U.S. Uh, well, there may many be places where Europeans will find that it's in their interest to uh, agree with the U.S. on certain aspects, but it's also in the Europeans' interest not to let this cascade, not to see a, a cascading into broad decoupling or deglobalization. Uh, so I, I, again, a, a, a European position where the Europeans stake out their own interests, but try to set up rules of the road, which is a very European tradition. I'm very impressed by your time management, Professor Nye. I think that was about just over three minutes. Thank you so much for that and addressing all three fantastic questions as well. Um, given that Shahab has been allowed to give a final remark, I believe it'd be very fair to have uh, Lise Butler do the same thing. Yes. So over to you, Lise. Hi, thank you. Apologies for the sound of the chainsaw in the background. Uh, <laughs> I am in fact in a forest. Um, uh, so just briefly to return to uh, my earlier point, um, the Marshall Plan, um, which I think, again, you invoked as a kind of positive example of soft power and of, uh, of leading with, um, to use your terms, um, uh, or power with, sorry, um, I think arguably represented a consolidation and an expansion of American power. Um, and the global politics of that period also allowed um, uh, European powers and the UK to retain their global status uh, at the heart of the Cold War world order. And I think that the question for me now is whether today countries like the US and the UK um, will be willing to embrace, as you put it, a power with approach if it means in fact less power for them overall, if power with means stepping back 
from uh, the, the center of the global order and adopting um, a, a, a broader and perhaps less central approach. Thank Should you so I, much. I, yeah. <laughs> yes, I'll leave no, it. I, respond to that response you have 30 I, seconds no, i think it's a, i think it's a very good point but i don't think there's that much contradiction if you if you want to achieve certain things such as dealing with pandemics or climate then your power over and your power with are not in uh they're not contradictory to each other one can can assist the other but but the point is will the u.s learn to adapt to a situation where it's going to have to share rules making with others including china that to me is is the right question and that is the right question uh, to conclude this fantastic transatlantic discussion on thank you so much joe i don't know about anyone else in this room but my brain is on fire i am buzzing with energy thoughts about the geopolitics of this the economics of this the biology of this, uh, the technology of this. And I think um, it would be fantastic to keep the conversation going in future digitally events. I'm sure James will mention this in his final, uh, final remarks. And also to mention that uh, I don't have TikTok myself, but I plan to be on that this evening, new account. <laughs> um, I'd also like to quote one of our attendees, Anna Annette Hester. She has said that uh, this, this conversation has effectively demonstrated ditchly soft power, and I would 100% agree with that, uh, in true Ditchley style, engaging and thought provoking. And from Robert Fox, hugely enjoyable and stimulating. So over to you, James, for the final, final, final remarks. Uh, my final, final remarks are, are, are very, very brief. Uh, one point of substance, I was really struck by Joe talking about Hollywood to Harvard. I think one effect of technology, of social power, of social media, and global interconnectivity is in a way that we are now as countries much more uh, authentically what we are. People can see. We're not a, pro a projection by leaders. We are what we are and the world can see. And that's a responsibility on us and how we deal with each other and, and how we build our countries. And ultimately, I think that might be good. So I think that's a really important observation. I found this a fascinating discussion, hugely thought provoking um and uh, interactive as well uh, and thank you first of all to joe for fantastic uh, prepared remarks at the beginning but also for an incredible supple and uh, responsive series of, of answers to what were uh, very sharp uh, and intelligent questions thanks yin for a great job moderating it's not uh, easy uh, when you're trying to uh, juggle with the technology and with people uh, but a real and a virtual thumbs up to you. And thank you very much, um, Lise, and uh, to Shahab, who's obviously gone for, for great uh, responses too and for helping us take forward. And finally, thank you to everyone else for the, the really great series of questions, which I enjoyed reading as well as um, hearing. Uh, as Yin mentioned, we, uh, we have a whole series of events coming up. Uh, we're continuing with small groups, which are necessarily by invitation. We had one last night about the nature of leadership required right now, whether it should be transformational or a stabilization. And of course, the answer is both. Um, but that was a, an enjoyable discussion with the transatlantic group. Um, we have the annual lecture coming up, which will be virtual, and which will be Michael Gove um, uh, talking about the UK's place in the world and the government's response, and then taking a lot of questions. And I think that's going to be uh, really interesting as well. Uh, as we look at the, the UK's future in particular. And then that will lead into what we're calling the Ditchley Summer Project, which we're working on frantically now, which will be a whole series of, of different sized events, different forms of events to help our community, this global community of people, um, address the questions of what do we value? Um, you know, what do we want to become? What kind of world do we want to remake? And crucially, what can we do individually, nationally, um, and collectively? And we, we're trying to sort of step back from all of the great reset initiatives to think it through uh, really what might be achieved. But thanks again, Joe, finally. Great uh, experience tonight, and I hope everyone enjoyed it as much as I did. And over and out from 
uh, digitally, genuinely, digitally, uh, digitally for, for now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.